Mr. Marco. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Science for Democracy and Mr. Marco for inviting me to share on the regional, the evolution of regional human rights systems in in the world. So my talk would not discuss much about the right to science. I have to say, and I, I hope Abdi would expand would expand. I think that notion. Hopefully, of course, there are some normative convergences that I would like to uh, perhaps reflect because some of the notions such as the development have also nexus or access to information for example so you see normative convergences here and there but my my role will be just to sketch the normative structure and also the institutional framework with respect to uh, regional human rights systems okay so i think to start with it's good to highlight that in terms of the the working method the modus operandi of international human rights law and regional human rights law for that matter, there are three tier human rights protection systems. You have it in the national level, which is the most effective, the most approachable system. So individuals can seek remedies when their rights are violated in courts of law or other in institutions. And there at the regional level, when national systems fail, of course, they seek remedy at a regional level or international levels. So the different treaties, for example, that Ethiopia ratifies, is testament to the uh, secondary protection that regional systems and international systems provide. But this system of regional and international protection is subsidiary in nature. So we call this the principle of subsidiarity. So international law is not a court of first instance because the presumption is that national courts are better placed to address violations of human rights, including violations in relation to the right to science, of course. Okay, so if you see the, of course, the international human rights system, you have, broadly speaking, the United Nations human rights system that operates under the treaty system and what we call the charter-based system. So under the treaty-based system, there are close to 10 major treaties, most of which Ethiopia has ratified. You can see the date of ratifications. There are some treaties that we have not yet ratified, and we hope to, I think, ratify most of these treaties because now there is, a, of course, a change of attitude, let's say, from the government side. Uh, so the treaty system works under uh, the different committees that supervise the implementation of the treaties. For example, the most prominent one is, uh, for example, the Human Rights Committee. So over the years, it accepts individual complaints, uh, and also it accepts state reports periodically that evaluates the status of how states are implementing their conventional commitments. One of the things, I think, in relation to Ethiopia is that we should be working is with regard to the individual complaint system under the UN. Ethiopia has not acceded to any of, has not acceded to any of the optional protocols, which means that unless states ratify, for example, uh, under the ICCPR, this is how it functions. If, if the International Covenant on Human Rights, on Civil and Political Rights Committee, the Human Rights Committee, would like to have competence over Ethiopia, of course, Ethiopia should ratify the first optional protocol, which is on individual complaints. So we have not ratified any of the optional protocols, and I think that's a big vacuum that we have to fill. So you have that under the charter-based system, of course, you have the thematic and country mandates. The thematic mandates study specific topics of significance in contemporary discourse on human rights. Right to science, I'm not sure if it is, uh, there is a special report on specifically on the right to science, no. So one of the things would be perhaps to advocate for the creation of a special report on the right to science to study the evolution of this norm in international human rights law. Okay, so in terms of the regional human rights systems, you see prominently three major regional human rights systems currently. The European system for the protection of human rights, which is the oldest and the most effective, of course. You have the inter-American system of human rights protection. And then, of course, the later one, you have the African human rights system. It's not actually late, considering, of course, political problems in Africa, because the charter itself was adopted in 1981, when ma major political problems were in Africa. There are some historical reasons why the charter was adopted at that time. So you have the Asian and the Arab human rights systems, which are fledgling. I will not be talking about that. Uh, so in terms of the European system of human rights protection, uh, obviously, this is the oldest, like I said, because of the post-world War II uh, political trauma that uh, resulted in, 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 in the commission of many atrocities, of course. They were very quick, I think, to establish a human rights system, a regional human rights system in Europe. So uh, um, 
it is the, the of course the convention was adopted on November for 1950 and it came into force in 1953 many of the provisions if you see that on including the freedom of expression liberty freedom of movement are informed by of course the universal declaration of human rights because the universal declaration of human rights was adopted two years earlier 1948 10 December which is of course international human rights day so uh, this is the first of course international human rights mechanism that was revised uh, and also the most effective uh, because of ma uh, many reasons that we might try to highlight uh, as we go on. So, uh, but also if you see, I think, regional systems including Africa and Europe and even the inter-American system, they have core conventions, for example, the European Convention for Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, or in the case of the inter-American system, the inter-American Convention on Human Rights and on human rights and the African Charter, but they have also supplemental protocols. We call them protocols. They are intended to expand the scope of substantive rights enshrined in the major conventions. So you have also different additional uh, protocols that you can see in the slide. So how does the European system operate? Maybe talking about the normative structure of European system of human rights protection. The most dominant doctrine in which the major organ, the European Court of Human Rights, which is seated in Strasbourg, adopts is what it calls the doctrine of margin of appreciation. So the court has over the years developed this doctrine in order to kind of uh, balance, find a normative equilibrium between the oversight power of the court itself and also respecting national constitutional traditions of states. So sometimes students are eluded because international law does not aim to create a universal one single system of law. That's not the desire of international law, original systems for that matter. So legal pluralism is accepted. And in fact, the way that the court itself tries to uh, maintain that legal pluralism is through the doctrine of margin of appreciation. So guarding the oversight power of the court and respecting with constitutional traditions of uh, states. So basically, it acknowledges legal difference and normative difference uh, as such. Uh, and, and a good example is, I think, the more recent case of SAS versus France uh, with, with respect to the prohibition of niqab. Uh, and, and in that case, the court said that because of lack of consensus on this topic, it said that France had the discretion to ban the wearing of niqab, which it was a very controversial case, as you know. But it's very reflective of how the, the court itself functions under the doctrine of margin of appreciation. Because at the core of it is that unless there is some level of consensus, the court will be very careful, very cautious to, to uh, inject its oversight power on, on normative issues. Of course, with regard to standards of review, the court uses uh, four or five techniques. It looks into whether limitations are based on law. That means that there is no de facto limitation. Limitations on human rights and fundamental freedoms, including the right to science, should be prescribed by law. And that is the basis of, I think, the principle. Are justified and reasonable? These are also, I think, adopted by national systems. For example, if you see the Constitutional Court of South Africa, it is its, uh, its fundamental uh, theory of uh, judicial reviews based on principle of reasonableness, whether limitations are reasonable under the circumstances. How does it specify the reasonableness? Of course, uh, it's a very detailed discussion. That warrants detailed discussion. So whether, pro of course, limitations are proportional to the aims achieved, and then whether limitation, less restrictive missions can, can be achieved in some particular circumstances. Like, for example, if uh, you have a right to freedom of expression, and if you have limitation uh, defamation as a, free, as, a, as a kind of limitation, so would criminal responses to defamation would be uh, valid in the circumstances, or would you decriminalize defamation? So you know, these kinds of, uh, uh, I think, avenues are usually explored through the, the court's uh, function. Of course, it has a very robust jurisprudence also. Over the years, it has s established very good standards of defining normative standards of human rights. The Ireland versus UK case, where it said five techniques, including sleep deprivation, uh, and, and other forms of deprivations do not actually constitute torture, but they constitute inhuman degrading treatment. 
uh, and other cases, the, the more recent case of SAT versus uh, France, Handicide versus UK, is very prominent with regard to freedom of expression. It's the most quoted case because in that case, the European Court said that freedom of expression does not only require accepting readily acceptable political ideals, but those that often shock or disturb. It's a very known dictum by the court. Okay, so you have this very uh, uh, robust case law that developed over, over, over the years under the uh, European system for the protection of human rights. I'm rushing, uh, rushing because there is no time. I'm, I'm, I apologize if I'm rushing too much. <laughs> Okay, so again, the inter-American human rights system, uh, this operates, of course, under the Organization of Amer American States, which was founded in 1948. So the major convention is, of course, the American Convention on Human Rights, but they do have also, they give also de legal recognition to the American Declaration of Human Rights. So the court said that over the years, the convention had some legal binding impact effect. And this is a very interesting, uh, Initially, it was a declaration, of course, but through the years, the court said that it has some normative force, actually. But, of course, the mother convention is the American Convention on Human Rights. And, of course, there are also additional protocols that were adopted. Interestingly, one of the unique aspects of recognition of human rights is the rights of older persons, actually. And I, I find it very interesting because the UN doesn't have any recognition for, there is no convention so far. And, and you, 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 I think there are some lessons to take also from the inter-American system. I will point out some very interesting uh, cases in the inter-American system, particularly in the inter-American court, that might be interesting to, to look into. So this is regarding the organizational structure. Of course, the principal organs of enforcement are in terms of the inter-American system. You have the inter-American commission seated in Washington, and then the court in, ha in San Jose. So two different institutions with different mandates, but both aimed at protecting human rights and fundamental freedoms. How am I doing with my time? Okay, okay, okay. So the Claudius Vres versus Chile. This is a very interesting case, which may have relevance, I think, to the topic of the right to science. So this concern regarding access to information about deforesting for project that was carried out by company, which was approved by the government. But the government did not supply to the public the extent of the deforestation and the environmental damage that would be sustained to the community. And actually, an NGO filed to force the government actually to disclose uh, the information. And this was not supplied by the government. And actually, the Inter-American Court said that, in fact, access to information is a basic human right as component of the right to freedom of expression. So I think I'm just thinking also in terms of framing the right to science, this is particularly very significant, of course, when there are environmental damages uh, to, to communities. And I think individuals can seek these kinds of, I think, disclosures from the government. And this has been one of the most seminal cases, actually, in the European, because in the Inter-American, because access to information as a normative value was later recognized. It was not... Uh, it was a later development, let's say. Even in the European system, they were very hesitant to acknowledge the recognition of access to information as a component of the right to freedom of expression. You can look at the normative history in that regard. Okay, so I think this case uh, is very interesting in, in the context of uh, 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 the right to science. So, of course, you have also the Barrios Atlas versus Peru uh, case, which invalidated amnesty laws, which are very rampant, of course, in the inter-American system. Uh, the Velasquez Rodriguez versus Honduras case, which it said that in this particular case, the practice of forced disappearance uh, is a, a multiple and continuous violation of human rights. A very interesting uh, normative articulation and try to uh, expand the meaning of uh, and the effect of uh, what this forced disappearance is and, and its uh, prohibition under the inter-American system. Okay, briefly about the African human rights system. Uh, it's, I, I think Abdi will add more points, I'm sure, in the afternoon uh, on, on the right to science topic. So it has very unique features. Like I said, it came in 1981. Uh, the treaty was enforced in 1986, of course. First, the African human rights system, and particularly the African charter, is very interesting because it's very comprehensive in, in terms of its approach. 
if you look at the charter itself, it includes all categories of rights, social economic rights, civil and political rights, and third generation human rights, what we call them, the right to development, the right to clean environment, the right to self-determination. So these are not only legally recognized, they are enforceable according to the commission's jurisprudence. They are also enforceable, justiciable rights under the African human rights system. So somehow it, it, it really corrected the historical asymmetry between civil and political rights and social economic rights. The very unique contribution of the African human rights system, which has particular nexus with the right to science, is the right to development. Article 20. This language of the right to development, this right has been, you know, you talked about uh, a sleeping beauty. Th this is one of the sleeping beauties that, has, that is not yet recognized in international law. Because the right to development, as you know, was acknowledged and recognized through the UN Declaration on the Right to Development in 1986. 30 years down the line, there is no treaty yet. And it's, it's, it's really, I have researched it on this topic. I have published on this topic. Uh, uh, it's a beautiful normative articulation, to be honest. But because of the highly political nature of the right, no progress has been made over the past 30 years of the, the UN human rights journey, and that's very sad. And I am afraid the right to science, hopefully it wouldn't have the fate of the right to development, but you know, sometimes you need very intense advocacy also to, to, to really set the agenda of certain normative rights. And the story of the right to development is very illustrative. But the African system is particularly uh, important because it is the only actually supranational, not regional only, but supranational instrument that recognizes a right to development. The Ethiopian constitution also recognizes the right to development. So the principle of humanitarian intervention, of course, is also a unique feature of the system. Justiciable socio economic rights protect us both individual and people's rights because if you look at the nomenclature of the charter itself, it says the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. So, I mean, a demonstration of the collective, the commitment to promote collective rights of people. So, uh, maybe we'll see some uh, enforcement mechanisms. Of course, the enforcement mechanism, uh, the African Commission on Human and P People's Rights, this is seated in Banjul, the Gambia. It's an old institution established in 1987. It had uh, progressed over the years, uh, of course, because initially there was skepticism, actually. S if you see the legal history, the, the, the case law of the African Commission, in fact, initially, states even were very reluctant to acknowledge the power of the Commission to accept individual complaints. It was in the Jara versus Gambia case, the first, one of the first cases. The Commission actually said, no, I have a right, actually, to accept individual petitions. If you look at the provisions of the charter, there is no clarity whether individuals are entitled actually to lodge complaints. So, th but this, this of course legal debate was later on dismissed by the commission and it is now, it, it has established itself as, as an adjudicator of human rights in Africa. And of course in 1998 you have the African court. Now from a commission which is quasi-judicial, you have a, a more transformative institution which is a formal court which has a power to give binding decisions on member states and member states would have to comply, of course, to, to, the, to the decision of the court. So the African system has both protective and promotional mandates. Under the protective mandate, you have the inter inter uh, individual complaint system, which I would say, if the charter, for example, the right to science is lit can be litigated, I would argue, for example, depending on Article 22, for example. And the good news is that the African Commission has been very generous in terms of accepting new norms under the African system. For example, the system in the charter, it doesn't talk about the right to food, for example, or the right to housing. But the commission says that they are component parts of other rights. So it means that one can claim, for example, that the right to science is component part of the right to development, in which case individuals can lodge to the African commission and court. So this is what, what uh, Franz Villon talk, talked about, the doctrine of implied rights. So maybe in the promotional mandate as well, I see an opportunity for, this, uh, for, to, for the right to science also to have uh, a place because the special rapport to a mechanism similar to the UN system, the African system also has certain thematic mandates on women, on prisoners, on freedom of expression. So why not on the right to science? There is no more significant topic, I would think, I think, than science for Africa, for example. Uh, we have uh, 
significant cultural virtues, but we lack scientific progress. So why not have a special rapporteur on science? And this is something that, uh, Mr. Marco, you would have to take as an assignment. But I see also a progress in terms of uh, expanding this notion of right to science in this regard. So the, the system has also developed a very, you know, uh, the jurisprudence is also very good because, you know, the one of the most prominent African human rights uh, scholars, uh, Makao Mutau, he says that if you actually look at the African human rights system, normatively speaking, it's very appealing. It's wonderful. It's beautifully framed. The only problem is its implementation, of course, and enforcement. Because most of the norms are articulated on duties, on right to development, on clean environment, you don't find par parallel articulating in the European system, for example. So, uh, but it has been brave in terms of expanding the, uh, the, the rights protected under the, the African system, the Serac versus Nigeria case, where it's established on socioeconomic rights violations. Uh, and it asserted that states failure to protect communities when they are affected by environmental degradation aff affects uh, uh, that it's a violation of their human rights. The Indoros community case versus Kenya, this is very interesting for the not maybe for the first time, but the African Commission elaborated on the normative content of the right to development more expansively. So what does development entail conceptually? So it tries to articulate it, and it, it's very interesting, I think, to look into these developments. Okay. Still time? Okay. Yeah. So generally speaking, achievements and challenges of the African human rights system, just reflect. So the significant achievement of the African human rights system is that it was able to articulate norms, concepts, notions that are very suited to the African way of life. So socioeconomic rights, for example. Significant socioeconomic deprivation exists in Africa. So it tries to inject state responsibility with regard to this. So in the European system, you don't find that. There is a European social charter, but the, the, the major instrument, the European Convention on Human Rights, does not guarantee access to education or access to health. Well, you can, we can argue on the fringe, but fundamentally, it's a civil and political rights, uh, predominantly an instrument. But the African system has been able to articulate norms very particular to the African context. The right to development. If you look at the, you know, the history of the right to development, Largely, it tries to have an equitable system of international economic order and national economic order. So equity, social justice, these are very uh, important issues, I think, in the African continent. So the system, again, coming to the right to science issue, it's very, in terms of accessibility, actually, it's very wide. So under the European Court of Human Rights, if you see the admissibility requirement, individuals would have to be actually victims to lodge complaints in the court. So, unless recent changes have been made, I think. So, so, but in the African system, you can, an NGO can submit an application in the African, even Science for Democracy, if it, if it got mandate and if it works on advocacy, can submit a case in the African Commission. I'll give you an example. For example, the, the first major case against Ethiopia, Haragoin versus Lati versus Ethiopia case, uh, which related to the significant delays in the trial of the Derg officials. Actually, the case was brought by a Gambian NGO, which had a seat in Gambia, against an Ethiopian government. And the commission actually accepted the case and entertained it because of this notion of actio popularis. And this notion says that because of problems of access to justice in Africa, the commission says that the widest possible extent they would accept complaints not only from victims, but also from uh, non-governmental organizations. The same you can look at uh, cases like brought against Eritrea, for example. They were not brought by, obviously, they would not be, case, I think it's less likely that cases will be brought from Eritrea because of the, the political situation, but cases were brought uh, by citizens and NGOs seated in Netherlands, for example, against Eritrean government. So uh, this, I think, openness generally gives, I think, tremendous room also for the right to science advocates to lodge complaints in the, in the African human rights system. I think I have talked uh, very fast. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Very fast, but very comprehensive as well. I understand that some of the issues may be present in other presentations. Um, 
It was suggested to take a break now and reconvene at 2 because some more students may be coming in the afternoon. Jonas, is that uh, the uh, correct assumptions? Okay, all right, so you decide, but uh, I have, uh, a bit, let's see if there are questions. Uh, I have, well, you gave us an assignment, and in fact, we were already working on a uh, part of that assignment. Uh, you asked the question, if the UN system has a special rapporteur on the right of science, there's none. Uh, the quotes that were used before were coming from the special rapporteur on cultural rights, because it falls under that category. Uh, everybody is uh, waiting to have the general comment on Article 15 of the, IC, uh, the International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Right to see how the comprehensive explanation of how that right should be implemented may also give uh, member states the opportunity to set up this new special rapporteur. But if you believe that also within the African system such a thing can be advocated, I think that the uh, Science for Democracy is more than ready to take that assignment and start lobbying in the good sense of the word for it because we could link the right to development to the next 10 years to ar arrive at the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goal and mix what is required within the 17 goals and the possibility to access Article 22 and see if in fact there would be, of course, going to a court is always the last resort of any action so if there is a, a better way to generate more a general political or policy interest to then arrive to the possible inclusion of such an issue among the issues discussed it's better if not uh, perhaps through you or thanks to your support we can actually find a specific case of a group or a, an individual that would like to go either to gambia or directly to the court and see what can actually be done. Uh, the Associazione Luca Coscioni has done that at the National Court, at the in, uh, Constitutional Court. Marco Capato is also at the center of one of those discussions. Himself has in disobeyed a law to, to uh, highlight how the law on the one hand was too old, but on the other was limiting the right to choose how to end your life if you are in uh, suffering. And also the European Court. One, in one of those cases, as recently as last summer, we also use the argument on the right to science. And they said, ah, but there's no, uh, how, there's no literature about the right to science. So little by little, as you were asking before, I think that would be the way to, to go about it because there is potential and we understand we are looking at 10, 15, 20 years and certainly 10 years uh, for the UN mandate to uh, achieve the Sustainable Development Goal. So the assignment is, we took duly note of that. I don't know if you want to add something to just want to say Marco, yeah, that will be very supportive, I think, on the idea of especially the special rapporteur. Uh, some of our colleagues who are also working in the commission are also Ethiopian, so, uh, you know, we can convey that message and also advocate for, for that kind of, I think, uh, um, path, let's say, yeah. So, who goes now? You, uh, Giulia Perron. because some of the issues that were, uh, Elena, you go. Okay, it's close to that. Uh, so we changed the um, slideshow in, in a way or another. Again, for those who just arrived, I've seen people entered later. Uh, this is a, a, a day of discussion to promote the right to science. It's promoted by the Italian NGO Associazione Luca Coscioni and the International Platform Science for Democracy. You can log on scienceforddemocracy.org and subscribe to our newsletter so that you can receive uh, information about what we do and also the presentation that uh, opened today's discussion. There is also another website that I would like to point out that's called freedomofresearch.org where you can find the uh, index on freedom of scientific research that Professor Boggio has developed over the last 10 years now and also the examples of how, in fact, if not real cases like the ones that were mentioned before, before the uh, Inter-American Court or the European system or the African system, these shadow reports that have been submitted to the UN Eco Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights to highlight how 
science has not be included when talking about human rights. So, Arena Bruci, Bruci, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Marco, and <clears throat> thank you very much for, for being here and listening to this talk on regional human rights mechanisms. Um, I'm lucky enough that m many of the issues that I was planning to, to talk about I were already mentioned, so I will be able to skip some things and uh, go faster on, on, on others. So, what I'm going to um, introduce a little bit, uh, in addition to what already has been said, is a general overview of why regional human rights systems are important, so what, the, what they are, what do they do, and why they are important in the international human rights law system. And then I'm going to look a little bit more at the European um, and the inter-American systems, since the African system is going to be um, addressed more in depth by Abdi after, um, and which kind of attention to science has been dedicated by these two systems, and then drawing some conclusions on the basis of that. So, uh, regional human rights systems. Um, to this morning, and, and, and as, I mean, the regional human rights systems have already been highlighted and mentioned, um, and they are quite an important and uh, important presence uh, in the international human rights um, space. Uh, as you can see from the map, they mostly cover all the world, um, and we do have only a few countries that don't, do not fit within um, regional human rights systems, but also it's important to acknowledge how re um, different regional systems have different uh, role and power and um, structures. So the three main uh, systems are the um, um, Organization of the American States that cover the Americas, um, then we have the African Union uh, in Africa, the Council of Europe that doesn't only cover the European Union that's a, a big distinction. The Council of Europe is not the same as the European Union. So it's a very well, uh, more extended um, organization that includes countries like Russia, for example. And then we have the Arab League and the ASEAN. Uh, although the Arab League and the ASEAN are very less developed than the other systems, so we don't have, for example, enforcement uh, bodies. We do have an Arab court, but it never, mm, um, can I have some water? <laughs> they never um, start functioning yet. So, um, it, I mean, as you can see from the map, regional systems are quite important. And are important, why? Because they, sorry. Because they offer uh, an amazing tool of uh, reconciling um, universality and relativism in human rights. As some scholars would say, uh, regional human rights systems are able to bring human rights closer uh, to home. What does it mean? It means that, uh, human rights are universal and they need to be universal, but that sometimes um, national and regional understanding may change and the needs may change. So uh, the way that we interpret rights uh, is important that uh, mirrors and reflect what we as different society are um, needing and uh, are understanding. So the regional human rights bodies are able to keep the universal nature of rights, but at the same time, understanding and adapting, translating these standards to uh, the national or the regional um, uh, needs and understanding. And they also offer a practical and effective tool for uh, protecting human rights, both at the level of promoting rights uh, when it comes to special rapporteurs uh, that are working on specific issues that are closer to the uh, local needs, but also effective when we talk about court uh, judgments that are binding, that differently from uh, what Julia will talk about, um, UN treaty bodies, that they are not binding in their decisions. Um, court uh, decisions are binding, so states have to comply with them. But of course, um, as has already been mentioned, they are last resort bodies. Uh, and so they are important in oversighting and um, monitoring the uh, action and the activities of the state and to ensure the states keep uh, respecting their human rights obligations, but they are not a first instance court. So they only come at the later stage. So if we compare a little bit the three main regional systems, um, uh, we can see that they are similar, but at the same time quite different. Council of Europe and the European Court of Human Rights is definitely the, the older one, the oldest one, um, and uh, the one with the most um, uh, member states. 
um, 47 member states. While when we look at the African court, it only has uh, 30 member states at the moment. Uh, and the Inter-American court, 21. So we see the difference in scope, but it's not so uh, uh, big. But what is different is the uh, um, uh, age of these courts and the number of judgments that they issue every year. So we can see how the European court has been issued 58,000 judgments so far. So with a medium of 1,000 uh, issues per year, that is quite a lot of judgment. So a lot of case law, a lot of opportunities for developing uh, rights and interpreting rights in different ways. While when we look at the African court, uh, we only have a medium of uh, 4.5 uh, judgments per year and the Inter-American court 12. This means that, of course, what we can expect from uh, the jurisprudence and the case law of the African and Inter-American court cannot be the same as the European because of the number of people that work in these in this bodies, the number of, judge, uh, of judges, and also uh, the number of um, cases that are issued every um, year. But what is important is all of the three of them, they issue binding judgment. Um, and the other important thing is that the European court works as a standalone court. So individuals um, can bring their case directly to the court. Well, in the case of the African court and the Inter-American court, it is first a commission. So individuals bring cases to the commission first, and then the commission will bring an, um, the case to the court if uh, deemed is necess necessary. So there are all these systems, but who can bring the case? Uh, well, this changes a little bit, and we can see the different attitudes of, the, of this court. So. Um, in the uh, Inter-American Court and in the European Court, okay, let's start with the European Court. In the European Court, since it's a standalone court, there is no commission. Uh, you, as an individual, you can bring directly uh, your case to the court. So individuals or member states. So member states can bring cases against other member states, but also you as individual. On the contrary, in the African Court and in the Inter-American Court, this is not possible um, because there is a commission. So you have to pass first through the commission and then you can bring, the commission will bring the case um, to the court. The uh, difference is that in the um, African system, um, there are uh, the, a specific protocol that allows uh, some individuals of some countries that ratify the protocol to bring directly uh, a case to the court. And only eight um, countries um, have ratified it so far. So that give an additional um, opportunity to bring directly the, the case to the court. Otherwise, you have to pass through the commission. And who can uh, bring it? Well, here we have a very different uh, understanding because in the case of the European Court, the European Court is really, really strict and allows only the victim or those who are directly affected by the violation to be able to bring the, court, the case. Or only in the case uh, of the victim being deceased or unable to bring the case, then someone else, the next of a kin, um, can bring the case. But the European uh, Court has been very, uh, very uh, strict in applying this and interpreting this uh, standard you know, in a way to like, limit the kind of n the number of cases brought to his attention. While the Inter-American Court and the African Court adopted a very wider um, approach. And the, the aim is to allow more people to be able to bring a case. So when something happened that is important for, for the society, for the country, uh, you, you don't, I mean, like the, the rationale behind the inter-American and the African system is that everyone needs, as you were saying, everyone needs to be able to bring the case to the attention of these human rights bodies that they will decide on this and improve uh, human rights protection. Um, which matter can be brought? So if you're a victim, you can um, bring a case, or if something happened in, in, and you are next of a kin or you are an interested person, you can bring a case. But which matters can be brought? Well, traditionally, you can bring the case um, uh, on the basis of one of the uh, a violation of one of the articles in the um, uh, fundamental conventions or covenant um, of the three systems. So, for the European Court, is the European Convention of Human Rights and its protocols. For the case of the Inter-American Commission uh, and Court, is the American Convention and the San Salvador Protocol. Only for those countries that ratified it, and this is a big problem because. Uh, the number of countries that ratify the San Salvador Protocol is definitely lower than the one that ratify the American Convention. Uh, while in the case of the African um, Commission and Court, and this is a brilliant innovation of the African system, is that you can bring a case um, concerning any treaty, any international treaty ratified by the state. So it means regional and international. 
and this opens to a wide range of rights that goes well beyond the normal uh, and, the, and the African uh, documents. So when can you bring it? Uh, so you, we assess who can bring it, what you can bring a complaint about, but when can you do it? Well, as we said before, those are last resort bodies. So you first have to go through all the domestic um, procedures and uh, remedies. So you, if you feel that you've been um, a victim of a violation, you have first to go through your national um, judicial system. And once you exhausted all this, so and at the end of all this level of appeal, you still feel that you've been violated and you didn't get justice for that, you can bring the case to the attention of these regional human rights systems. But then you have to be very uh, careful on when you can do it. Because there is a rule that you cannot do it like after two or three or four years. You have to do it within six months after the last domestic judgment or from the commission of the violation, whatever happened the latest. So it, it's also a way to keep the um, assessment of the violation quite timely and uh, relevant for, for uh, giving justice and, and remedies. Uh, what is interesting is that in the African system, there is not this specific um, definition of the six months. There's only a general within a reasonable time that may allow a longer period of time to be able to bring the case. What is also true is that often the um, African system, African um, Commission and courts have interpreted this as the six months because it's the term of reference in regional human rights uh, systems. So. Once we have highlighted the main regional system, we can move to uh, looking at the European one, and which is the normative framework on the right to science. Quite disappointingly, there is none, no reference to the right to science um, in the core uh, documents of the, of the Council of Europe, especially those that um, the courts have jurisdiction on, so the European Convention and its protocol. And it's quite disappointing because although the European Convention is mainly a civil and political rights convention, then it was um, enriched with a lot of protocols that talk about education, for example. And we would expect something similar about culture and science, but this uh, was a big failure from the, from the Council of Europe. And what it was a big failure is also that we have a European Social Charter, and it has been revised a couple of times, and still we don't have any mention um, of the right to science, also in the, in the European Social Charter. So we do have a failure, I mean, we see a failure from the, from the um, European, um, for the Council of Europe to incorporate the right to science and, those, and therefore international standards. But at the same time, we expect that maybe through case law, the European courts could be able to overcome these gaps. Because in, order, in a lot of situations, uh, the interpretation of case law and human rights are beautiful for this reason because they're quite vague. So you can interpret them as you want in a way if you're a willing judge. So it's possible to fill gaps and to extend protection to other rights, especially through very general rights like the right to life. The right to life has been used oftentimes to include other specific rights, not including in a specific convention. However, looking at the case law of the European courts, we have another disappointment because there is very little attention to, to the right to science or the importance of, specific, of scientific development, and there is no mention of the right to science or right to benefit from scientific development. Um, and we do have some um, mention, like very scattered mention of science or scientific development here and there in cases um, most of the time related to reproductive rights, gender reassignment, abortion, embryos donation, but all the time they are put in contrast with bioethics, uh, with regional um, and moral and cultural understanding and concerns. And most of the time what the courts have done is that not recognizing a right to science, but also just saying this is a very complex matter where a lot of uh, very sensitive um, concerns come into play. So this is when we do a step backward and we leave the state um, um, allowing, I mean, um, enjoying a margin of appreciation, so a margin of maneuver on how to regulate this very sensitive uh, issue. So in a way, the European court is taking a step backward and not entering into the debate. And this is very disappointing because of the huge relevance of the European court in the regional human rights systems and in development of uh, international human rights protection. When we look at the African, of the Inter-American Courts and the Inter-American Human Rights Systems, 
we do have a, a, a better picture. Because likely in the San Salvador Protocol, Article 14 mirrors Article 15 of the uh, International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights and establish a right to science, a right of individuals to enjoy the benefits of scientific and technological progress, and also uh, recognize the benefits uh, to be derived from the encouragement of development of international cooperation in relation to the field of science. So the, uh, the article is really promising and offers a very ground basis for a lot of interpretation and case law on the right to science for further um, uh, imp improving it in the, in the Americas. However, when we look at the case law, we have another disappointment. Why? Because no petition have been submitted yet under the Article 14 of the, of the San Salvador Protocol. So uh, the Commission had never had a chance to rule on it. But at the same time, uh, nor the Commission nor the Court have never got the chance, I mean, not the chance, but like never took advantage of the fact of having an Article 14 to include it in the reasoning uh, on other rights. Um, is it true that the case law of, the, of the, both these bodies have been mainly focusing on civil and political rights, on issues like torture and forced disappearances? But in the recent times, more cases uh, concerning also uh, issues like gender reassignment or, or abortion have been um, submitted to the attention of these bodies, and both the court and the commission never mentioned Article 14. Uh, however, we do have one mention of the right of the importance of benefiting from scientific development in a case concerning the in vitro fertilization, Arcavia Murillo versus Costa Rica. Uh, although, again, it was not formulated in, on, as, a, as a right, but only as an important, is important for, um, for people in Costa Rica to, to benefit from what has been developed uh, from a scientific perspective but then not formulated in terms of right, no mention to Article 14. Uh, so it kind of show uh, the willingness of the court of not establishing this link with a specific right. Uh, so quite disappointing from this aspect as well. So in conclusions, uh, regional human rights systems can and are a very important uh, piece of the puzzle uh, of the human rights, international human rights law protection system. And they can actually uh, be a good vehicle and for enforcing the right to science, especially, um, I mean, in, in, the, in the African and in the inter-American system. The European, in the European case, we have an excuse that is the normative excuse that is an, maybe an obstacle because there is no right to science in the European Convention. But at the same time, we don't excuse so much the, the European court because in other circumstances, um, push the bar and, and, and fill the gaps uh, with its evolutive interpretation. Uh, what I see as a risk is that since like the Inter-American Court and the African Court often refer to the European um, case law as a kind of benchmark and um, I mean they draw inspiration from different European case law, the fact that the European Court didn't uh, develop any, any jurisprudence on that and actually was re is really reluctant from accepting a right to science, this may put off a little bit uh, the Inter-American and the African Court and kind of like um, make them uh, be reluctant from embarking on uh, uh, the embracing this new jurisprudential path. I hope this is not the case, uh, but this is a risk I see, but that's why I think we, we need like to advocate more and bring cases under the right to science before the African and Inter-American uh, bodies in order to push these bodies to, I mean, they have the normative framework to do it, so we need to push them to also act on it and um, decide on this right. Thank you very much. Thank you. We certainly be, will. Any questions? All right, so I'm told that the food has arrived, so we break for one hour and we'll reconvene at two with the rest of the panel. I apologize for the other speakers. And we'll uh, uh, sum up then with Marco Capato and his conclusions and, and final remarks. Uh, we have lunch which is going to be served to everybody here. Bon appetit. See you later.